Hi, and welcome to um, Talking Books with Shauna. I was doing um, this this afternoon, um, when at my usual time of 2 o'clock Eastern Time, and something went wrong, <laughs> and the whole live video just disappeared into the ether. So I decided that I would um, do it again. So um, here we go. So the topic for today is some of my favorite reads of 2020. So obviously um, I can't cover all of them, but I thought I'd pick some for every age group and a little bit of uh, fiction and nonfiction. So hopefully um, you'll, you'll find something in this mix that you might enjoy just as much as I did. So I'm going to start at the younger ages and I'll start with picture books. So I'm going to talk about a couple of picture books here. The first one is uh, Bon Voyage, Mr. Rodriguez um, by Christiane Duchesne, and it was illustrated by Francois Disdale, and um, they're both Canadian writers. And this charming picture book um, shows children in a small village by the sea watching an older man as he faithfully takes a walk every day. Um, they become even more fascinated when his actions on his daily walk suddenly become much more varied. Um, he floats above the ground instead of walks, or he flies a dove on a long string, balances a fishbowl on his head, or ties wings to a cat. The children are fascinated and intri intrigued, amused, and this shows in the illustrations. They are just wonderful. I really like the innovative activities that he did, the mystery of his actions, and the diversity of the children that were pictured. I really also loved the way that everything was illustrated, with the mix of realism and fantasy and the details and the different scenes. There's lots for kids to look at here. This is a book that really explores the imagination and leaves a lot for the reader to decide on their own. Just a beautiful book. So that's Bon Voyage, Mr. Rodriguez by Christiane Duchesne and illustrated by Francois Thisdale. The second picture book I'm going to talk about is by an Australian writer and it is called A Quiet Girl by Peter Carnivus. And I really love the illustrations in Carnivus's books both the way he draws nature and the quirky individualism of his human characters. But the other fantastic thing about his books is the subtle yet meaningful way in which he tackles larger issues and makes them real for kids. Here in this book we have Mary who is a young girl who is thoughtful and quiet. We see her noticing the world around her, especially the individual noises that are made by the different things in her world. She engages in thoughtful activities and she tries to share them quietly with her family. But her family is the opposite of her. They're loud, they make noises with different tools and toys and um, devices, and they talk really loudly. And they don't hear Mary. Um, so they tell her to, to speak up, to talk louder. But Mary stays true to herself and remains a fairly quiet girl. She actually becomes quieter and she notices even more around her. Not just the things she hears, but the things she sees and the things that she feels. The smell of nature, the feel of the breeze on her face. She is present in her world in a meaningful way. And at first, her family just continued on with their noisy, normal behaviors. Um, and they finally noticed that she wasn't uh, around. She had disappeared for them in some senses. And they looked for her and they called for her. And it was only when they stopped and they listened that they heard her singing softly to the birds and they realized what they had been missing in their normal activities. The book includes a two-page introduction to mindfulness at the back 
and it gives some suggestions about how to be present in your own world, like Mary is in hers. I really liked the one suggestion when they ask you to close your eyes and listen and identify the quietest sound that you can hear. It's beautiful and simple to do and so satisfying. So that is A Quiet Girl by Peter Carnivus. The next book I'm going to talk about is for slightly older children, and it is called The Elephant, by P also by Peter Carnivus. And this lovely little book um, tells the story of Olive. And Olive lives with her dad and her grandpa. And her mom died when she was very young. She really only remembers her through photographs. Olive can see that her dad isn't happy. And even though he has a routine that he does when he gets home every day, he's really just going through the motions. And whenever Olive looks at her father, she sees beside him a large gray elephant, one whose shadow darkens everything around it. And she knows that until that elephant goes away, he won't get any better. And she's been thinking about this for a while, and she shares her thoughts with her friend Arthur. And Arthur is a boy who listens, and he also reads a lot, and he does his his research. And so he gives her some good advice, and then he also begins to read about elephants to see if he can learn things that might help Olive. And at school, they are celebrating the school's 100th anniversary, and at the end of the term, the children will be bringing something old to show the others and share with them. And Olive um, thinks about things that she might want to bring that are meaningful to her. Her grandfather suggests a typewriter and a record player, and she enjoys those things, but they don't have the same meaning for her as something more personal. So um, Olive has a really good relationship with her grandfather, and every so often when he comes to pick her up from school, he'll be wearing his purple backpack. And when he wears this backpack, she knows they're going on an adventure. And there are times in, even though he's doing much better than her father, that her grandfather gets sad too and has his own gray creature by his side. And Olive and Arthur, working together, um, try to find a way to make the elephant and the other gray creatures go away. So this is a great book to help kids understand when someone in their lives is struggling with depression. Um, the use of the different animals um, bring the idea of depression to life in a very physical way. And the way that people work together to make things better for everyone shows there's often a way forward past the depression. The illustrations for the book are simple, and yet they show so much. From the jacaranda tree that Olive loves to sit in to think, to Olive, Arthur, her teacher, and the other characters, as well as the gray animals, especially the elephant, which wears its tiny black top hat. This draw, draw, uh, the drawings in this book will really bring the story to life for young readers. So that is The Elephant by Peter Carnivus. Also for slightly older children um, is a book by a Canadian writer called Hardy Holds His Own by Colleen Nelson. And this book is um, telling, it's the second book in a series about Harvey, um, and the first one was called Harvey Comes Home. And Harvey is a West Highland Terrier um, who lives with his owner in Winnipeg. His owner's name is Maggie, and she's going to be starting high school soon at, at a private school for girls in Winnipeg called St. Ambrose's Academy. She has some continuity because two of her friends are also starting in the same school. And one of the requirements at school is to do volunteer hours. And Maggie looks at the list of places that she has that she could volunteer at. And she uh, decides to choose Brayside Retirement Villa because it is a place that she's already familiar with. And so is Harvey because he went there in the first book. And 
she's a bit nervous going to the retirement villa, but she finds that the staff and the residents are very welcoming, and she's allowed to bring Harvey with her when she goes. Austin, the boy that found Harvey in the first book, is also volunteering at the villa, and he's really happy to see Harvey again, and a friendship develops between Austin and Maggie as the book goes forward. One of the thing we may, things that Maggie does at the retirement villa is sort books in the library, which is very out, out of order. And she also helps a new resident, Josephine Fredette, unpack and begins to develop a friendship with Josephine as she learns Josephine's unique story. I really enjoyed this book as we see Maggie grow and venture into new experiences, and we see a little bit about Winnipeg history as well. We also see Harvey develop in this book. Um, he is a real um, terrier um, in nature as well as in breed, and we see his doggedness as he senses an intruder in his territory and hunts it down to ensure that it doesn't return. He also is very empathetic towards Maggie and towards the residents that he visits when they go to the seniors' home. The drawings really bring Harvey to life, and I liked how the drawing at the start of every chapter gave a hint of the story that was going to happen in that chapter. There are lots of interesting characters here, and this is a great book to learn a little bit of history and learn a little bit about animals and learn about helping other people. That is Harvey Holds His Own by Colleen Nelson. The next book for kids um, is also part of a series, and it is called uh, The Skeleton Coast, and it's by an Australian writer, Marty McConaughey. And this book is the third book in the Quest of the Sunfish series, which started with the flooded earth and continued with the castle in the sea. In The Skeleton Coast, um, they continue the story that began in those earlier books, where the children are on their father's boat, the sunfish, looking for their father who has disappeared because of the people that are looking for him to try and silence him. And this is a time when the earth's waters have risen and humanity has grown more divided. And there are haves and have-nots. And one of the people that they picked up in the first book, Pod, um, is a refugee child who was put into slavery and ended up stranded in the ocean until their ship um, picked him up. There are all kinds of adventures in this book, from pirates to dog packs, and they must use all the skills and ingenuity to stay together and on their father's trail. I really liked the way that each child brought something to the quest, and that without all of them, they wouldn't be successful. None of them is perfect, but they recognize that and accept it. This is the story that shows all the children having unique and necessary attributes, and I liked that gender wasn't an issue. Bravery is shown by all of them at different points in the story, and weakness is also shown by all of them. I also like some of the larger issues shown here around fairness and diversity. So that is um, the book The Skeleton Coast, the third book in the trilogy Quest of the Sunfish by Marty McConaughey. The next book I'm going to talk about is for um, teenagers, but also really appeals to adults as well. And this is the third book in the Ab Horseman series by Garth Nix, uh, a New Zealand writer, and it is called The Horseman. Um, the first book was called Sabio, the second was Lirio, um, and there are two books following Ab Horseman. There are also some books that were written afterwards that are kind of novellas that fit in between these five books in the series. The main character in this book, Abhorson, is Lirio, who was also the, one of the main characters in the second book. Here, this continues the story of Lirio as she follows the trail that has been foreseen by her as she searches for Sam's friend, Nick and the great power that he is in the process of releasing, that of the destroyer. 
This is a world of magic and a world of um, good and evil. Lirio must go into death to use a device called the Dark Mirror and see how the Destroyer was bound back in the beginning and kept under control so that he did not harm the world. She needs to know that so that she can know what needs to be done now to control this, this terrible power. Um, she's accompanied on his quest by the teenager Sam, who also has his own abilities, and the mysterious disreputable dog. She's also um, accompanied by the cat. Um, well, it's sometimes a cat, and sometimes it's not a cat. It's a bit of a shapeshifter called Mogget, um, who is bound to the Abhorson. As they travel, um, they go by ways previously unknown to them and to the world that is outside the Old Kingdom, even when it is in front of them. There are also hordes of refugees in this world that are looking for a better future. It's a time of great change and great danger. And while most of this tale follows Lirio, we also get glimpses of others along the way, including Sam's parents who are having their own j terrible journey um, and facing incredible dangers. All of these stories come together and um, there, it's a tale, as I said, of darkness and of power-hungry manipulators. And it's a tale um, that reminded me of some of the refugee journeys we see in our own world and the things that are unfolding here. I have the fourth book in the series, and I'm looking forward to reading that one soon. So this is the third book, Abhorson by Garth Nix. I'm now going to move into adult fiction. And the first book I'm going to talk about is a bit of a fun read, um, and it is called Vintage 1954. This is it, and um, it is by Antoine, Antoine, Antoine Lorraine. Um, it is, he's a French writer, and it is translated from the French um, by Jane Aitken and Emily Boyce. And this light novel has a really interesting premise, time travel due to drinking wine uh, made from grapes affected by an alien spacecraft. That sounds really outlandish, but the story is way better than that description. So back in 1954, um, a man, Pierre Chaveau, saw a UFO. It appeared suddenly above his vineyard, stayed for a while, and then suddenly disappeared. He was not the only one um, to see UFOs in that year, it was a very active year, and no explanation for the phenomenon was ever discovered, although some people did do research into it. In 1978, Pierre opened a bottle of wine from that year that he had laid down, and he shared a little, as he always did when he had a bit of wine, with his German shepherd. The next morning, the two of them set off for work at the winery, but they never arrived. The main story here now begins in 2017, where a group of people get together for an impromptu celebration at an apartment building. They are all living there. Some are temporary people, some have newly moved to the building, and others have lived there all their lives. One of the temporary persons is Bob Brown. Bob is an American who is staying in an apartment that is an Airbnb. He is on a trip to Paris from Milwaukee, a trip that was planned long ago to happen with his wife. But his wife has um, become ill and she is back home in a coma. He has taken the trip because um, he knows that she would want him to go even without her. Um, his wife, Goldie, is um, very meaningful to him, and they have a very strong relationship that has developed over the course of their marriage. Other people that have moved into the building recently are people like Magali Lacour. Magali is a restoration specialist, and she took over what used to be a carpet shop on the ground floor of the building, which has shops. 
with apartments and storage areas above. She uses the former sixth store storage area for the carpet shop as her apartment. Another person that has recently moved into the building is Julian Chaveau. He is the great um, grandson of Pierre Chaveau, the, the vintner, um, and he works as a barman at the famous Harry's Bar. And he's always been fascinated by his great-grandfather's story and wonders what happened to him. The other man in this story is Hubert Lenardi, and he has lived in the building his whole life. It was his family who originally built the building back in 1868 and gradually sold off bits of it as they needed the funds. He retains a lot of pride in the building and in its fixtures and accoutrements, and he's recently raised issues with some of the things that need fixing. For instance, the cellars all have big shutters on them, and some of those have fallen into disrepair, and he's worried about people accessing the building through those broken areas and stealing um, from the residents. Um, he goes down to the cellars one day to check on them, and he is um, drawn back into memories from the past, from the myriad of objects that have been stored by his family over the years in their cellars. One of the things he finds is a bottle of this 1954 wine, and he gets stuck in the cellar um, due to um, circumstances. And the person that um, hears him first is this visitor from America, Bob. And Bob gets help from Megaly and Julian to get Hubert out of the cellar and um, out back into his apartment. And H Hubert then decides to share this bottle of wine that he's found with these other three people. When they awake the next morning and venture out, they find themselves in a bright and sunny Paris, and only gradually as they start noticing things aren't right, do they realize that it is 1954, and then they um, begin to go on adventures, and they find and connect back with each other to try to figure out how to get back to their own time. It's a fascinating book with all kinds of quirky things going on. So that is a vintage 1954, by Antoine Larani. The next couple of books I'm going to, oh no, the next book I'm going to talk about is short stories. And it is called When We Were Birds by Maria Munch. And this is a Canadian writer. Um, she has, a, she was a finalist for the Governor General's Awards. This is a debut collection of short stories. And these um, stories are punctuated with photographs that the author take, took, as well as these exquisite drawings from an 1884 book called Practical Taxidermy. These stories have a large element of fantasy about them. There's a lot of elements of the natural world um, as they enter the lives of the people in unusual and interesting ways. And the book has three parts with a few stories in each of those three parts. Prefacing each story is either a photo or a drawing, sometimes with a quotation at the end of the word, um, uh, sorry, sometimes with a quotation that relates to the story. For instance, in the first story, the peregrine at the end of the world, the image is a diagram plate of a bird skeleton, and the story has a young female peregrine that has been turned into a woman. But one is unsure whether it is a woman that has been turned into a peregrine that turned back into a woman, or just a peregrine that turned into a woman. And the fate of this character remains unclear as well. But she's a very likable character. Um, there are lots and lots of images within the stories that add meaning to the stories in an additional way than just the words. Some of the stories here uh, include a theft that is both planned and unplanned and results in a different ending than the one that the narrator imagined. 
a woman um, that believes that people go missing is the, char the character in another story. And she believes that they leave some sort of electrical presence behind them. Uh, although her lover does not agree with her. There's also a story about the hurricane's effect on a marriage. Another story about a woman who inexplicably starts to have small messages come out of her body on little pieces of paper. And there is a man who runs um, away from his lover after she's been injured. Some stories are also reimaginings of fairy tales, such as Red Riding Hood, Sleeping Beauty, or Blue Beard. Two of the stories involve Glenn Gould as a muse. These stories are absolutely mesmerizing, and I love this collection. And that is When We Were Birds by Gloria and Nick. The next couple of stories are romances. And here there is a, um, the first story I'm going to talk about is an American story that's uh, an LGBTQ romance. And it is called Written in the Stars by Alexandria Bellafleur. And this romance takes place in Seattle and is a delightful rom-com of a read. One of the two characters, Darcy Lowell, is an entrepreneur and an astrologist on the verge of a really big business deal. Her and her partner, Margot, um, signed a deal with a popular matchmaking firm. Um, these two astrologists are um, going to be providing um, astro astrological information to the people that sign up with this matchmaking company. The person that they've made the deal with at the matchmaking company has set up Darcy with his sister, Elle who's recently come out of her own painful breakup and moved to Seattle for a new start. But things go very badly on that first date, which is par for the course for Darcy lately. And Darcy feels really down, not just because of the outcome of this date um, and her non-existent love life, but also because she feels that her family doesn't see her unconventional career choice as a serious venture, despite her recent successes. Elle is also not feeling great about her life. Um, as I said, she just come out of a breakup and she's tired of her brother trying to set her up. And she doesn't have the energy to keep going on bad date after bad date. And so she fibs to her brother and tells him that the date went really well and that um, she's going to be seeing Darcy again. But then she finds that she has to bring Darcy into this uh, lie and get her on board um, to be able to continue to uh, fool her brother. And as the two of them spend more time together, they find that um, they have to get over the lack of trust that they've had because of the past situations that they've been in. Um, and they also have to um, find out about each other's families to be able to navigate um, this situation. There's a lot of intriguing things happening here and I have real trouble putting this book down. So that was Written in the Stars by Alexandria Bellafleur. The other romance um, that I'm going to talk about is also American and it's set in Nashville and it is the second book in a series. It is called Undercover Bromance by Lisa K. Adams and the first book in the series was the Bromance Book Club. The third is Crazy Stupid Bromance. And the fourth is coming out later this summer. And it is called Isn't It Romantic? Um, this book, I could see the signs of the plot in the, near the end of the last book. And the main character in this book is Braden Mack. He's a restaurant and a bar owner, and he's actually the man that started the um, Bromance Book Club. And the Bromance Book Club has a very interesting premise. It has a group of men reading romance books in order to make their relationships with the women in their lives better. And Braden... Um, we get to see into the past where he started reading romance books 
and how he started the book club and how he uses the books to improve everybody's relationships and get through some of the situations that they find themselves in. He's been using the books, but not as deeply as he needs to if he really wants to have a truly meaningful relationship. And so when he's on a date um, at a fancy restaurant, um, everything falls apart. And that date ends that relationship, but it also begins a, a, a reignites a connection that he made back in the first book with a woman named Liv Papandrenas. She's a pastry chef at the restaurant and the sister of one of his friend's wives. And she's on a mission to uncover fraud, abuse, and misogyny in their town. Um, she isn't really interested in Braden, but because he is a very charming man and he has a lot of connections, she finds that um, she keeps encountering him and some of the things that she's working on um, are helped by things that he is doing. So it's a really interesting book in that there's a depth of plot, including some bigger societal issues, and there's also a, a hot romance going on. So that is Undercover Bromance by Lisa K. Adams. The next book I'm going to talk about is a, a Canadian first novel, and the author, Andrew Unger, writes a satirical Mennonite news site from the heart of uh, Manitoba's Mennonite country, Steinbeck. And the site, The Daily Bonnet, is well worth a look. His book is called Once Removed, and his main character here is Timothy Hapner, who is also a writer. He's been working as a ghost writer for the older people in his small town in southern Manitoba, and he also works for the local parks and rec department, mostly doing laboring jobs. Timothy's wife, Katie, is just finishing up her master's thesis, and she is from a nearby town, Altfield, uh, which is a town that is preserving their heritage and even has an archives. The town that Timothy and Katie live in, Edenfield, uh, was established back in 1876 by Mennonite immigrants, but the current mayor, B.L.T. Weens, has been chipping away, whittling away at the town's heritage for years, to the point that very little remains of the original buildings um, and uh, a lot of their heritage traditions. Katie and Timothy are both members of the Preservation Society, which is a small group of uh, local people that are trying to stop the loss of their heritage. Um, the mayor has been doing things like renaming the streets after places in Southern California to get rid of the Mennonite um, history in the town. Um, he's been tearing down buildings to make way for desired big box stores, and he's been discouraging the use of the Mennonite language, Platte Deutsch. Um, the town is pretty insular. Um, one example is a woman uh, who is still called City Sheila, even though she moved to the town two decades earlier. Um, Timothy's best friend, Randall, is also um, a local, and he is also a writer, and he is the one that got Timothy into ghostwriting and connected him with some of the local people that he's writing for. He also, um, his parents live in one of the last house barns left in the city, or in the village, sorry. Um, Timothy um, is given a task by the Preservation Society to write a book about the history of the town, but he's really worried that um, this task will expose him to um, the ire of the town and the mayor and jeopardize his town job. But as he begins to do the research on the town and talks to more and more people, he finds that he is starting to own 
um, take on ownership of this heritage that is his own heritage as well and his own culture. And the book takes place over the course of a year which uh, with four chapters each representing a season of the year and each um, titled with the name of a season in Plat Deutsch. Um, this book um, really shows the history and culture um, and the importance of knowing what your history and culture is. Um, and it also uses humor to really best affect some of that lesson lessons that it shows. Um, the characters have real depth and complexity and make you want to know more about them. I really enjoyed this book and I hope that you will too. It's called Once Removed by Andrew Unger. The next book that I'm going to talk about um, is uh, by an English writer and it is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Matt also has a nonfiction book coming out this summer that he considers a companion book to uh, the Midnight Library and it's called The Comfort Book and it's full of things that he's found comforting. This book um, is got so many themes that really spoke to me during this time that we're going through. Loneliness, depression, imposter syndrome, perfectionism, family divisions, and regrets. The main character here is Nora Seed, and Nora Seed is a woman who struggled with loss and guilt for a lot of her life. She was a very good swimmer when she was younger, and her father had high hopes for her to go to the Olympics. He was really pushing her in that direction, but that isn't what she wanted to do. Um, she started in high school to explore other interests, and she got into music for a while, joining her brother's band as a singer and a songwriter. But she got severe stage fright and panic attacks before performing. And she didn't want to um, have the fame that went along with such a public career. She also got engaged earlier in her life. But she found that um, there were things about that relationship that really bothered her and she didn't feel heard or appreciated so she did not go through with the marriage. Now she's been living with her cat in a small house back in her hometown and she feels that um, her life is a bit empty. She works in a music shop but she really hasn't got any friends and when her cat dies she feels that no one will miss her. She's estranged from her family and unmoored, she decides to end her life. When she awakens, she is in front of a building and she walks in to discover that it is a library filled with books and she is met by her old high school librarian, a woman that she is very close to. Each of these books that she sees in this library shelves is a different version of her life. A possible world that she could have lived in if she'd made a different choice at some point. It might have been a small thing like letting her cat outside or a large thing like traveling to Australia when her friend went there. Everything in this life would be different in some way for one of those small decisions. Nora has the opportunity to look at the regrets that she's had about her life and decide to see what life she would have if she had chosen differently at any of those points. I think this idea of regrets and what ifs appeals to most of us in some way. What if we'd gone to a different school, majored in a different uh, subject, dated a different person, traveled somewhere differently, or gone at a different time? But is there really a perfect life? After all, no person is perfect. Why should we expect our lives to be perfect? This is a book that makes you reflect on your own life and consider any regrets that you might have and think about how you feel in your life. I really had trouble putting this down. It was just so engrossing and so um, reflective. So that is um, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. 
The next book I'm going to talk about, and the last fiction book in this um, talk, is The Sparrow Sisters by Ellen Herrick. This is also um, the first book in a two-book series, followed by The Forbidden Garden. And Ellen Herrick is an American writer living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This book takes place in a small seaside town in New England called Granite Point, and the town's only doctor has recently retired and sold his practice to a younger man, Henry Carlyle, um, a doctor who had previously worked in nearby Boston and in the emergency department and also in the military in Afghanistan. He was injured there, he has a leg injury, and he has a backstory that is gradually revealed um, throughout the book. The town's residents are pretty friendly and close-knit, and among them are three sisters who live together in the house that they grew up in and who run a garden business selling plants, flowers, and produce. There were four sisters, but one of them died of cancer under the care of the doctor who's recently retired. The younger sister, um, Patience, um, short for Impatience, um, the flower, has a touch that she may have inherited from an ancestor who was accused of being a witch. Patience um, has many quirks. She uses the herbs and other plants that they grow to make tonics that the people in town rely on. Um, and another interesting thing is that patients' moods manifest in different ways. Different herbal scents come off of her, depending on what mood she's in, giving a hint to the people around her. And the weather seems to be um, affected by whatever mood she's in as well. Um, her body temperature fluctuates as a sign of what's happening to her internally. Her two older sisters, Sorrel and Nettie, are very protective of patients and also have their own personal connections to men in the town that they've never acted upon. When the new doctor hears about patients using these herbal tonics and the widespread practice of people in the town in using them, he gets a bit um, suspicious. He doesn't like this idea of this alternative um, non-traditional medicine. And um, he begins to question patients, even though he is also drawn to her as she is to him. There's also a young boy in town who's kind of been taken under Patience's wing after he um, lost his mother. His father's very disengaged, still grieving the loss of his wife, and Patience has been teaching him plants and giving him cookies, and um, she also uses a tonic on him when he has been forgetting to take his medication. When a tragedy hits the town and a local man erupts uh, very emotionally, um, Patience is made the target of some of the blame for what has happened and things get really crazy in town. I find the book really fascinating and I like the way that the people in the town reacted under the pressure of this tragedy, particularly the women. So that is The Sparrow Sisters by Ellen Herrick. Now I'm going to talk about some nonfiction books I really enjoyed. Um, the first one is a memoir, autobiography, um, called The Tender Bar by J.R. Moringer. And Moringer is a novelist and a journalist who has won a Pulitzer for his newspaper feature writing. This is a captivating book, um, coming-of-age book, really. Um, J.R. spent most of his growing up years in Manhasset, New York, which is on Long Island. Um, his mother had moved back into his grandparents' home when he was very young, um, escaping a bad marriage, including some domestic abuse. Um, she was struggling to save enough money um, to move out of her parents' house, and she finally followed a sister out to Arizona and made a new life for herself and Jr. there. But Jr. was sent back every summer to New York to stay with his grandparents and spend time with his cousins. 
Um, JR's um, uncle, um, Charlie, lived with his grandparents as well and worked in a nearby bar and kind of took JR under his wing, taking him on outings to the beach, to baseball games, and um, on other excursions with his friends, many of whom also worked in the bar. So the bar became a kind of focal point for JR um, with all the men that he admired and spent time with working there. He grew up listening to their stories and watching them and trying to be someone that they liked. Once he got to be drinking age, he had his first drink in the bar and it became even more central to his life. I like the characters um, that he grew up with, the various idiosyncrasies that each one has, and how JR makes them come alive. Um, Colt with his voice like Yogi Bear's, Joey D, who's large and manic and has a way of talking into his breast pocket, Bobo, a very handsome man with a lovable black mutt of a dog, and um, there are also nicknames of the people that the bar owner Steve has given. As we see JR grow up and go to university and fall in love um, and try various jobs before finding um, the career of journalism, he also comes to terms with issues in his life from the phantom of his father who has been ever present in the background of his life to his class awareness and to the role that alcohol played in his life. This is an absolutely fantastic read. This is The Tender Bar by J.R. Merriman. The next book is one of history, and it is called Les Parisiennes, How the Women of Paris Lived, Loved, and Died Under Nazi Occupation. And it is by Anne Seba, a British biographer and journalist. It's a fascinating look at history with a real female focus. The book is set up chronologically, with each year getting a chapter up until 1944, which gets two chapters, and um, then um, the post-war years get a chapter as well. Um, there were overviews at the beginning of each chapter on what was happening generally, and then uh, it moved into a focus on a pati on particular women that we see in more than one time period. These individual women are mostly from higher social classes, as more is known about them and thus available um, in terms of research information. They include women that are active in the resistance, women that are resisting in less formal ways, and women who collaborated at various levels and with various degrees of success. There are Jewish women targeted for their heritage. There are Jewish women who managed to fly under the radar of the authorities. And there are women who were just trying to live their lives however they could manage. Some women were driven by personal circumstances. Some were driven by the love for a man and some were driven by the love for a cause. And there were ones who really didn't seem to understand the reality of their situation even after the war was over. I learned a lot about these women and about the lack of support and recognition that they received. Whether it was the Red Cross refusing to approach the Germans about Ravensbrück because it wasn't a PO camp, resulting in the women being kept in the camp much longer than some of the other camps were. Um, even though some of the women in the camp were actually sent into their situations that they ended up in by the Allied forces. Um, there was a lack of recognition, recognition for the role that women played by the political leaders and the, even the historians until much more recently. This is, is a story of suppression of women's voices and of women's accomplishments. It's also a story of Paris. Paris is almost a character in this book showing its role in history before its time, this time and since, its role as a fashion capital of the world, and the ingenuity of many of its citizens. This book is very readable and very well researched, and is an excellent addition to uh, any history collection. So that is Les Parisiennes, How the Women of Paris Lived, Loved, and Died Under Nazi Occupation by Anne Seba. The last book I'm going to talk about 
is a book that's really um, an eye-opening book in an environmental way, and it is called Fire and Ice, um, Soot, Solidarity, and Survival on the Roof of the World by Jonathan Mingle. Mingle lives in Vermont and writes on the environment, on climate, and on development for a variety of publications. This book uses a small village in the Himalayas as a focal point for environmental concerns in a way that makes them even more relevant and personal. Mingle first met the people of the village of Kumik in the Zanskar Valley of the Himalayan Mountains of Northwest India back in 2012 when he was asked for advice on how to build homes to take advantage of pass passive solar energy something that he had experience in. The village of Kumik is one of the oldest villages in that part of the world, and it depends on water from the glacier above it for both its daily life and its sustaining agriculture. But the water has been providing less and less over the years, with the glacier shrinking and most of the remaining melt-off going down the other side of the mountain to other villages. So the village people have been looking at their options as every year means that they have to decrease the number of fields that are under cultivation and the men are forced to work away at other jobs out of the village. They come to the decision to move the village to a new location where they can arrange irrigation from a nearby river and they will be building this village from scratch and want to do it in a way that takes advantage of things like solar energy as much as they can. Through Mingle's words, we see the intricacies of village life and how they depend on each other. We also see the long history of the social contract, which has um, um, neighbors supporting each other with the two necessities, fire and water. Violators of their social contract are cut off from both of those necessities, putting them in the position of not being able to survive. We see Mingle's work and his interactions with the villagers over a couple of years as they decide to, um, as they gradually build the new village. Um, they have many meetings and they make many decisions and they work together for their future. One of the things that Mingle does as he talks about these things is he brings in information from outside the village. He looks at why the glaciers are shrinking and the role not only of carbon dioxide, but also of black carbon. Black carbon um, often appears as soot and it has many effects on the environment. Not only does it pollute existing glaciers, but it also causes them to heat more because of the dark color, and thus they shrink more quickly. Um, it also has uh, effects on human health, and indeed the health on all living things, as the soot in the air gets breathed in. Thousands of people around the world die every year due to the effects of black carbon. Um, and black carbon's health effects are seen very locally, but its environmental effects are global because those particulates travel quite a long ways. Many of the world's poorer countries are using cooking and heating fuel that contribute to the production of black carbon, and not only through the type of fuel that they use, but also in the way that it is burned, leaving those unburned particulates in the nearby atmosphere both in their homes and in the air around their communities. Um, black carbon is also an output from the burning of diesel fuel, which is often used for generators in remote communities, as well as for transportation in many parts of the world. Um, even in the developed world, the use of wood-burning stoves and heaters contributes to the pollutant of black carbon. I learned that the color of the flame is a strong indicator of the presence of black carbon as an output. The bluer the flame, the cleaner burning it is. That orange glow we admire in a fire is not a healthy sign. In many instances, there are ways to tackle this. Um, they 
development and distribution of cleaner burning stoves and heaters needs investment and government support worldwide. And it also needs infrastructure and training to support the maintenance of the new units. You can't just give them to people, but you have to teach them how to um, look after them, how to repair them, um, how to maintain them. Um, in a developed world, we can replace wood stoves with pellet stoves um, that burn more cleanly. Uh, there is a lot of hope in this book that people working together can make a real difference. And we see how uh, the people in this village are making a difference and the people in other parts of India and on other parts of the world. Um, there's just so much in this book that talks to the environment and both the things that are going wrong and the ways that we can make changes. So that is Fire and Ice, Soot, Solidarity and Survival on the Roof of the World by Jonathan Mingle. So those are just a few of the books that I really, really enjoyed in 2020. And I'd be interested to hear in what books you really enjoyed last year. And please add that to the comments when you watch this. I appreciate that. And I'll be back here next week, hopefully with more glitches. Thanks.